Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today with the Values into Action New Jersey and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia presentation on transitioning into IDD adult services. The New Jersey transition to adult coordinated care bridging, excuse me, building a bridge between pediatric and adult care. Thank you so much to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia today with their presenters, Dr. Alyssa Siegel and Stephanie Pratico, the program manager. Thank you for having me. So, um, so we have uh, created a program at CHOP um, in, uh, specifically for New Jersey patients um, that we it, base out of the CHOP Specialty Care Center in uh, Plainsboro. Um, we are very much aware of the challenges and the difficulties that, uh, that people face if um, they have been in the pediatric system for a lifetime um, with multiple people managing their care in the pediatric setting and then suddenly have, having to um, transfer all of that care to new people um, at the same time that many other changes are happening in their lives. Um, and so the, the program is intended to provide some assistance um, for whatever is needed. And for each patient, for each family, uh, there may be something a little bit different that's needed. Uh, we see any, any person with intellectual developmental disability between the ages of 14 and 26. Um, and we're actually very happy to start in the mid-teenage years because we, we do consider it a transition of, of care and not a transfer of care. So that transition does occur over a period of years. And there may be certain uh, processes during, uh, along the way that are necessary, but also it gives us a chance to know uh, a family very well um, and be involved uh, uh, ahead of that process um, as the process is occurring and then to stay on indefinitely until we know that, that everything is settled. Um, the, the, on the screen is a, a screenshot of our website, and there's more information that you can see, um, and it's, you know, the full web address is listed here, but you can also easily find it by Googling um, just CHOP and JTAC. If I can have the next slide. So just to put things in a little bit of context as to why we understand this program is necessary, um, for families that have a child with um, some kind of intellectual developmental disability, um, and oftentimes that that specific aspect of their life is um, a small part of a larger medical condition, um, there are services and people that become involved at a very early stage. So in some cases, it's before the baby is even born. And then all along the way, there are members that join a team and, and the family really builds a mountain of support along the way. And some of the members of that team are steady partners throughout a lifetime. Um, and then, uh, uh, and that may include members of the school team as well. Next slide. And especially with, um, when it comes to the school, um, really because of the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, there are many programs in place with a goal of preparing children with any degree of disability to be fully integrated in their community once they are, um, once they graduate from high school. Um, and that is the only entitlement that they are given is um, a free and appropriate uh, public education in the least restrictive environment. But of course, that entitlement ends at age 21. And at that same time, it, re it really happens in coincident with um, a need to, to change uh, medical providers as well. Um, well. While they may not be an eject button per se at age 21, um, oftentimes um, there are suggestions by the medical providers that, that at some point they will need to transfer their care. And this is a very difficult process because oftentimes um, the doctors involved have been longstanding caregivers um, with, with uh, they've gone through you know, difficult times together, made decisions together, built a relationship um, where the physician may actually um, respect the family's opinions and observations over all, all others. And so the families are often very, very nervous that they have to forge a new relationship with a, with a new person that may not have that same respect. Um, and they may not be familiar with the, with the child and right now adult condition. Um, and and uh, in the midst of all that, there, there are considerations about how much the, the teen or young adult should be involved in their own care and are they ready for assuming a more independent role.
Um, so among the things, uh, in addition to the things I mentioned, there's a long list of things that need to be accomplished during that time period. So in addition to finding new medical providers and making sure that they have all the information they need to provide good quality care, there may be obstacles uh, related to insurance uh, because that may change at a certain age. Establishing legal authority, enrolling in new government assistance and social service plans, finding new responsibilities, whether that's educational or new vocational opportunities, or even, um, even new responsibilities at home for the young adults, um, possibly considering adult living situations and discussing matters of sexuality. So any one of those things is a project in and of itself, but when they are all piled on top of each other, it can be quite overwhelming. And as we know, life is not always so kind as to, um, to give us one challenge at a time. Oftentimes, these things are happening um, at the same time that, that there are other family dynamics that are changing. So siblings that may be in the same age group may be moving out of the home and going through their own transitions. Um, and those siblings may be individuals that were very helpful. Um, the, um, the, the child or young adult with, uh, with disabilities may not understand what the absence of that sibling. Um, grandparents that were previously indispens indispensable helpers may be less able to offer their support and may need more help themselves. And parents are uh, reaching a retirement age, worried about financial planning, and worried about their own health, taking care of their own health, and, and facing realistic views of mortality, which is probably um, among the most difficult um, concepts that they need to talk about. So you may have heard of, of this uh, being referred to as a disability cliff. cliff. And that's a, um, a phrase that has resonated with families uh, because really uh, many of these supports that were in place for so long seem to disappear. Um, and there really is nothing in, uh, to take its place. So, um, so in terms of why, why is there such, uh, why is, transferring care from the pediatric to adult setting such a challenge. Um, so, uh, so for one thing, uh, it's just a different culture. Um, in the pediatric system, you are starting with an infant in, in many cases um, and talking to a family and that family is always involved in providing the information and uh, making and helping make the decisions. Whereas in the adult world, they're dealing directly with the patient, oftentimes restricted from a legal point of view from discussing the condition with any other, um, any other family members. In the pediatric system, there is generally a lot of assistance with coordination of care, um, and not only the coordination of care itself, but maybe a lot of hand-holding, a lot of understanding of um, all, of the, um, all of the integrated systems that are, in, that are needed to make, uh, to make for a, you know, a streamlined uh, system. Um, whereas in the adult world, independent coordination of care is expected. Um, and oftentimes there, there's not much direction given. Pediatricians, of course, are knowledgeable about childhood health conditions and adults may have limited experience with the health conditions that are now extending into adulthood. So, uh, so you may ask the question, when is a child no longer a pediatric patient? And that's actually a pretty controversial topic. Um, I think that up until very recently, there was no consistency, um, even within the CHOP system. Um, in 2017, there were 44,000 patients over the age of 18 still being seen in the pediatric setting, many of whom had um, chronic medical conditions and intellectual developmental disabilities. Um, I actually just randomly called different departments departments just out of curiosity to see if they would have like a specific policy about accepting new patients and transferring their existing patients. And I really got um, very different responses from, from each department. I would say that more recently, there is a growing awareness um, that there's some kind of a problem here um, that families don't want to leave the pediatric setting um, and maybe in many cases can't leave the pediatric setting because there is no alternative on the adult side. Um, and there, there is a stronger effort to, to make uniform policies, um, which may or may not wind up being a benefit to each individual family. Um, so, 
because there is this growing awareness in the medical community, there have been some studies looking at whether or not families are being prepared for this transition. Um, and there was a study that was published just two years ago in Pediatrics, which is a leading uh, journal for pediatricians uh, from the American Academy of Pediatrics um, that included a survey of over 20,000 young adults um, or teenagers 12 to 17 years old. And their outcome measure was um, just based on these three items. The healthcare provider discussed an eventual shift to an adult provider. The healthcare provider actively worked with the youth to gain care skills or understand changes in healthcare at age 18. And the youth had time alone with a healthcare provider during the last preventive visit. And only 17% of youth with special healthcare needs met that overall transition performance measure. And I think that, you know, considering the list of things that, that I posted on a slide previously, um, all of the things that need to be accomplished, the fact that we're not even achieving these minor details um, is very disappointing. So as far as why this is such a challenge, um, I, you know, we, I've touched on it already very briefly, um, but to, to formalize an understanding of um, what's happening within this triangle. So there are three parties involved, really. There's the pedi pediatricians and all the pediatric providers, um, the adult providers, and the family. Um, and so CHOP had conducted um, surveys to try to get some more information, a better understanding of what each of these parties was going through. Next slide, please. Sorry. Um, so from the pediatrician's perspective, and when I say pediatrician, um, it may be physicians, it may be other members of the pediatric care team, um, but the pediatrician specifically said that um, transition guidelines that have actually been established are pretty unrealistic. Um, they require um, a lot of time that that really is not very practical in uh, a regular office setting. Um, as I mentioned before, there's no consensus on when um, ch children should be transferred to adult care. Um, and there has been poor documentation of transition plans, even when there's an electronic medical record. So in other words, um, in a place like, like CHOP that has a shared medical record, each each specialist um, may look in the chart and some may have transferred their care and some may not and nobody really knows what, what, the, other, um, what the other members of the team are doing. Um, and of course, um, the pediatricians feel obligated needed to um, connect families with adult providers that have sufficient expertise um, and we, we may not feel that there are physicians out there um, and then those options may be further limited by insurance. I have found that um, in, as the survey, you know, sur survey corroborates that um, that pediatricians are not really addressing medical decision making. So many of the patients are, are um, aging over 18, staying in the pediatric practices, and nobody has talked about guardianship. Um, and then when they transfer to an adult setting, um, the families, uh, you know, have difficulty being involved in the in the planning because their um, their opinions may not be honored if there is not a formal legal document in place. From the adult perspective, the adult provider perspective, um, they, they uh, cite that they have inadequate time for office visits and um, coordination of care that occurs between the office visits. And of course, there is not very much compensation for efforts outside of face-to-face -face encounters. And that's not a criticism of the dedication of those providers, but probably a very practical limitation. Um, and again, they, they are, uh, there's a concern that they may not have the training or expertise to care for adults um, with childhood chronic conditions. Conditions. Although many of the conditions that we're talking about have, um, have successfully progressed so that these, uh, these families are caring for children that, that live into adulthood for many years. So hopefully there is more and more experience growing. Um, but adult doctors also feel that they have lack of information on community resources. And not just lack of information, but there may not actually be as many community resources as there were on the pediatric side. And the adult providers uh, complain that there are inconsistent levels of communication from the pediatric providers. 25% said that medical summaries or records were all, always or almost always provided. And it would be extremely difficult to uh, assume the care of a complicated patient when you don't have those medical records. 10% um, saying that it was never available. 
So, so what happens from the, from the patient or parent perspective is that they feel very um, poorly prepared. They may lose services that occurred in multidisciplinary clinics um, where there were medical services and physical therapy, occupational therapy um, integrated into those clinics or integrated into the school program um, that, that just disappear um, when those services disappear. Um, there may, again, there may be lack of adult providers and loss of insurance that restricts those options. So the end result is that it's a chaotic transition. Um, they may not be able to achieve continuity of care and they may not be able to trick, um, stick to their treatment plans um, for, for reasons as simple as they can't figure out who will help them refill a prescription or um, they've already been discharged from their pediatric practice but they haven't um, established care with an adult practice. So things as simple as getting a flu shot may become more complicated as well. And the families become very dissatisfied and it creates substantial anxiety. So, um, so that is the basis of our program. We're trying to bridge that gap. Um, and what we do is uh, we allow two hours for a first time visit, because as you can imagine, we are gathering 20 years, let's say, of medical history and all of the daily events that occur in the family's life, um, trying to identify what their needs are now and what their needs may be in the future so that we can make the best plans. Um, before COVID, we were doing all of our visits in person at this uh, CHOP Specialty Care Center in uh, Princeton. And after COVID, we've gone to nearly 100% telehealth. And there are tremendous advantages, of course, to doing telehealth, especially with a family that um, has difficulty transporting an uncooperative person um, that may not want to go to the doctor or sit in a doctor's office for two hours. Um, and so we've been, and also, you know, I noticed that they have records more accessible at home. Like I'll ask a question and I'll say, oh, I know exactly where I have that information and be able to grab it um, from someplace nearby. Um, and oftentimes we will interact with the patient themselves um, on the video, but then they can wander off and do their own thing. And it makes it much easier for the parents to engage for the full visit. Um, so as I said, we do a comprehensive review of all of the medical history, behavioral needs, social and community support needs. And by doing so, it allows us to communicate with the physicians already involved um, and uh, even support coordination agencies, um, representatives that we contact um, through DDD or OBR. The program also, um, we've actually um, partnered with our occupational therapy department, um, and they're very interested in helping um, young adults to maximize their independence at home and in their community. And some of the skills that they focus on may be different from what was offered in school. Um, in the schools, there's you know, often a strong focus on things that can advance their academic achievement, um, whereas some of the practical skills um, at home and in the community may not have been addressed. And then one of the um, probably most uh, substantial contributions that, that we can offer is that uh, many of our patients need psychiatry support. Um, and it's it's very, very difficult to find psychiatrists that have uh, the skills to work with this population, that have the interest in working with this population, um, and that are affordable. Um, and so we offer psychiatry visits after the initial visit, if necessary. And we can do that um, uh, by offering a second opinion or providing direct care to the, to the patient. We try to review anything that, um, that is affecting the families at this time, and certainly things that, that may not have been addressed elsewhere. So trying to get information about the, the different um, guardianship options and assessing decision-making capacity. Um, we don't directly connect families with a specific attorney, but we at least help clarify some of the, um, some of the confusing information um, and um, you know, just offer our guidance in that way. Um, Social security benefits, of course, are, are um, important to also establish Medicaid and, um, and, and connect um, to the eligibility for DDD services. And again, some families that have already been receiving Social Security benefits up until 18 are, may, may not be aware or may get lost in navigating the system um, to, to restart that process all over again. Um, so we can help with um, application process or just pointing things in the right direction. 
Um, I think we're going to talk a little bit later about um, how to find vocational opportunities and what kind of services may be available. But um, but as new activities um, are are established, you know there are new questions that may occur um, as far as uh, arriving at those new locations. Um, some individuals may be may be able to independently travel and we can provide some information about how to um, make sure that they can can do so um, safely if they're going independently. And also just provide information about other transportation benefits that may be available in their communities. Um, so, so we, um, I don't know that we spend a lot of time talking about specific options for adult living situations, but again, this may be something that um, families are, are considering and confused about and, and don't really just don't know where to start. And so we can, um, we can connect people with the appropriate services to get that information. Um, we, we have, uh, we often talk about safety. Um, again, depending on level of independence, there may be new environments that the, um, that the individual is going to be experiencing um, and families are very worried about um, their vulnerability and um, whether or not they have um, judgment um, to avoid some of the um, dangerous situations. So we can provide links to, um, to some safety products and, and agencies and, um, and just information that, um, that might provide um, new, a new awareness. So I thought it would be most helpful to just talk about some of the patients, um, some examples of, of how we've helped different patients. And I've tried to choose, um, you know, to be honest, it's kind of hard to choose because every, every family, as I said, may have different needs and it may demonstrate um, different ways that we offer our support. Um, so what, here's our first example. So we saw an 18 year old young man with autism gastrointestinal motility problems, migraines, and anxiety. Um, and when we first saw him in February 2019, he had all pediatric providers, um, and, uh, inclu which included neurology, GI, ophthalmology, allergy, psychiatry, and a primary care physician. Um, so again, we reviewed his past medical history and identified any problems that he was currently experiencing, but also anticipated um, what his needs would be in, um, down the road. Um, and, and by doing so, you know, it, like I said, it takes about two hours to go through all this information. Um, but once I have that, and once I can review the records, I can I can um, kind of sort through it and create a document that is portable that they can, that families can bring with them to any new doctor that they see. Um, and and I think that with with my background knowledge, I can pick out what I believe to be um, the most important information that a new provider would want, um, and kind of like filter out all the other things that may not be quite as important. Um, and, and in doing so for this patient, I did contact several of the current providers to ask questions about certain aspects of his care and made suggestions for changes because many times, um, even when, when uh, complicated patients have a primary care physician, that primary care physician is not really overseeing the complexity and the um, communication that may need to occur between all the different members involved. And, and I can take on that role um, you know, indefinitely, um, even when they are transferred to a new primary care provider, until we until we really feel that everybody um, is ha is knowledgeable and comfortable with the care. So, as I said, from uh, February 2019, when we first met this family, um, as of September 2020, we successfully connected him to a primary care physician that they're very happy with, as well as a new neurologist. And those were the most important members of the care team at that point in time, and also um, conditions that were stable enough to transfer um, I think we certainly don't expect all of the transfer to occur at the same time um, and wouldn't necessarily even advise that. And so we can help to prioritize which ones are um, timely um, to be able to do that transfer. So in terms of the social supports that we offered, Stephanie Pratico is my colleague and um, she um, is very, very helpful at discussing all of these things. So Stephanie, maybe you can take over from here. Yes, absolutely. So we try to really have a holistic approach as Dr. Siegel has already outlined um, through the, the program description. Um, and so with this particular patient, um, they had no 
um, knowledge of the Division of Developmental Disabilities, um, DBR, Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, um, the process of getting into DDD and completing the NJCAT. And so we walk the family through um, the whole process um, and link them to the proper resources within the division to get that started. We also went over with them, you know, on the website where to find the sample of the NJ cat so that they would be prepared on how to answer those questions so that the individual would, would then get the benefit um, of the actual tier level and funding that was, should be allocated to support care, which a lot of families come to us and don't understand um, how that actually, um, that equation is, is done and how to appropriately answer those questions. Um, this particular individual, because of the anxiety and um, the diagnosis of autism, had issues with um, pain and also, um, as I said, um, anxiety. And so we were able to provide a weighted blanket um, for use to sort of try to address some of those issues. And so um, he could get some additional support. Um, we, there was also... Um, a question from the guardian about a therapy dog to address the anxiety issues. Um, and of course, you know, how the, the um, view from the medical perspective of how potentially the gastrointestinal issues could be, <clears throat> excuse me, could be aggravated by the anxiety. Um, we thought it would be important to look into um, how we could possibly start an application process for a therapy dog. And so those were resources that we were able to bring to the table. And then the other one issue that we identified was that there were not a lot of recreational opportunities um, and community opportunities for this individual. And so they were not aware of Special Olympics um, and other recreational activities in their community. And so we were able to bring those resources to the table for the family um, so that they could explore it. And when they felt comfortable and when uh, the patient was in a good place um, to actually take advantage of those opportunities. They already had the information to, um, you know, presented to them and so that they could start that process and get them involved in those activities. So this is another uh, case example that is a little bit different because this was an individual that was 18 years old, so not necessarily pressured to transfer their care. Um, and, and I think a very good example of why it's helpful to have us involved at a younger age. So this was um, an 18 year old female with autism who was non verbal and had significant aggression that included um, injuries to herself that had been worsening, worsening over the course of several months. Um, so she, her, her medical history included epilepsy and an, an abnormal um, uh, vascular connection in her brain that was monitored um, periodically with, um, with, with imaging. Um, but when, when the family had uh, mentioned, and again, this is, and they're not necessarily coming to us um, to say her behavior has been getting worse. What, why do you think that is? What should we do? It's almost that it comes up incidentally in the conversation. Um, but because nobody was really you know, overseeing the, the totality of her care, um, nobody had really given thought to, well, why is her behavior worsening? Is it because of certain seizure medications that she's on? Um, she had pretty severe insomnia, so could it be because of sleep deprivation? She hadn't had a dental exam in many years, so could there be um, some pain that, that had not been identified? And the same thing for her ears. Her ears had not been examined because she was not able to um, cooperate with an exam for many years. Um, so, so when I heard that, that she was to have a sedated angiogram, I, you know, the word sedated perked my ears up and I said, you know, let's take advantage of the opportunity to do every thorough investigation that we really need to do. So, um, so we, we made arrangements for her to have an EEG on that same day um, as a convenience to the family because she needed that EEG anyway. Um, so the EEG had to be done prior to the sedation. Um, and then once she was sedated for that test, um, we made made arrangements for her to have a bedside dental evaluation, have her admitted overnight, um, and while she was there in the ICU being monitored, um, have her ears examined by an ENT person, 
and, um, and then uh, in the morning to have her neurology outpatient visit. So being able to, to accomplish all of those things, the neurologist was in a much better position to make decisions about her medications, and we could have a, um, a higher level of confidence about whether or not there there were other factors contributing to her behaviors. Um, and actually one year later, she was off all of her seizure medications and still having behavior problems. We actually had not heard from them throughout most of that time, um, but when they came back to us and you know, now with, with many of those factors being eliminated as part of her worsening behavior, you know, it did, did seem like this was probably time to have a psychiatrist involved and consider behavioral medication. Um, and so we are now seeing her periodically um, for for regulating those medications. And hopefully, you know, the, in terms of the psychiatry component, you know, the hope is that we will um, eventually be able to transfer her psychiatry care to a provider in the community that can provide care long term. But again, because there are very few that, um, that are accessible, we can, we can provide that care in the interim. And actually, before I'm going to have Stephanie um, jump in to talk about some of the other details. But you know, I just want to mention that while we were in the visit, they they mentioned that because she um, this this uh, young young woman. Um, had such difficult behaviors to control that they had they sometimes had to put uh, protective mittens on her and there was a specific type that was given in the hospital during one of her prior hospital stays um, and they had been completely worn out at that point and the family had no idea where to find them they didn't they weren't really able to describe them for us um, and then I, you know I made a few contacts at CHOP assuming that you know somebody in one of the departments that that usually gets involved with this type of thing would would point us in the right direction direction. And to me, this seemed like a very simple, very small, very trivial thing to offer, but it was so meaningful and so important to the family and made such a difference in their daily lives. So, um, so even very, very simple things that, that we can accomplish, um, you know, hopefully will make a big difference. And that, oh, oh, Steph, can you go? Can go back, yeah, if you can go back to the slide, I think Steph <clears> has <throat> to add. So just as with the last patient, I mean, it, <clears throat> excuse me, at age 18, when an individual comes to us, um, you know, the family was not aware of Social Security SSI benefits, um, and they were not aware of the fact that, you know, we are a Medicaid-driven state, and so you can't have services without having Medicaid. And so that became one of the primary focuses of the home and community-based um, supports part of the visit. Um, and so we talked through the application process of Social Security and um, aided them in applying for Social Security um, SSI benefits so that they would then in turn get the Medicaid um, component. Once those things were in place, um, then we talked about um, how PPP can be accessed and how to apply for an assessment to um, initiate the PPP program um, in fact, you know, we will actually complete and make the referral to the um, HMO for PPP services. Um, and then we proceeded into the DDD intake process. And although, you know, as most people on this call probably know, you can't access those services until 21, it's always good for families to have that preparation of what that process is going to look like. Again, what the NJCAT um, is you know, what that assessment tool is used for, what that equates to, and how that budget is developed to then support that individual beyond age 21. And so we have found that when we deal with families um, who, you know, have not really been infused into the system or had much support in how to access these supports and services, it's nice to have that time to work with them, to prepare them for what life will look like at age 21, so that when 21 comes and that transition happens, um, it's not such a shock factor um, and that they have started to, started to give some thought prior to that transition um, to what they, they feel needs to be in place to support that individual to have the, the best um, life available and have all the supports and services for the things that they can be engaged in. And so we talked through all those um, components and then we will, we will continue to follow them um, depending on the medical need or the social support need and, and the concerns and questions that come up for families. So, you know, when we say assisted in a social security um, application, you know, that's not a one and done um, conversation, right? So that can be many steps. 
um, and it can be many calls back and forth to really sort of guide them through the process um, and the paperwork and all those types of things that are needed. And then the same with the personal preference program. And the same holds true as the years pass from 18 to 21, or if we start that process at 16, um, you know, the same holds true that we start to have these conversations so that people can be prepared. Um, because as any family member knows, when that transition comes to fruition, um, it can be very overwhelming because there are so many things that need to be in place. And all those things that were once in place, um, say under the school system, and all the teams that were involved when a, an individual is in the school system, um, they, all those supports and services are gone. Um, and so families start to feel very abandoned and <clears throat> very lost in navigating all the different components of transition. And so we start those conversations early so that they have a, a more, more of a comfort level going into it. And then we're also there. So if medic medically it's dictated that we follow them every six months, then we will, maybe it's annually, um, but we definitely keep track and support them in the process. Yeah, so for the two cases that we talked about already, we have some longevity with them. Um, and as Stephanie said, you know, it, months may go by where we may not hear from them. Um, and then all of a sudden something will come up and they realize that we may be in a good position to help with something. Um, and, and we're very happy to do that. Um, and then there are other patients that have, um, you know, there have been patients that it was a one-time visit. We satisfied their questions. We pointed them in the direction. They didn't feel like they needed anything else. And we are going to be there when they, you know, when a, a new need arises. Um, so here are some just quick one-liners about some, some different things that we were able to help patients with. So um, we saw a 16-year-old with CP that had severe sleep apnea, um, and the pulmonary doctors were trying for about a year and a half to achieve some compliance with CPAP. But of course, you know, keeping a mask on, you know, with sensory issues and um, just poor cooperation, you know, seemed to be pretty impossible. And with increasing sleep deprivation for the patient and of course for the parents, um, things were getting more and more complicated. Um, the 16 year old himself was having more seizures um, and um, there, there really seemed like no solution to the problem, but nobody had tried to arrange overnight nursing services. Um, and in fact, if I say, you know, there was a little bit of a disagreement whether or not it was time to have nursing services, that he might become more agitated by somebody trying to force the mask in place. Um, but I, I, you know, I thought it was worth a try. Um, we, we tried to make the arrangements. Of course, it was denied by the insurance. Um, I arranged for an appeal, which was a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with um, a physician at the insurance company and um, did get it approved when they understood the details of the problem um, and they um, and uh, they you know with that home nursing they the nurses were very very um, very patient and very careful and have really achieved some success and it's really made a huge difference um, in the child himself and in in the family's quality of life um, we saw a 20-year-old with a congenital brain malforma malformation leading to intellectual disability and, um, of course, needed physician certification of incapacity for guardianship purposes and really only had one physician, didn't really have anybody else that was in a position to help. So, um, so over the course of three visits, we got to know the family. I became more familiar with his capability based on review of his medical and school records. And we did some formal intelligence testing in the office as well um, and were able to complete that certification. And again, I don't think this family really has needed us for very much else. Um, but that one thing was it was, um, you know, a big burden for them that we were able to alleviate. Um, we saw a 22 year old with Down syndrome who had multiple complaints and complicated medical history, but had had no lab tests for over a year because of anxiety related to the blood draw, which of course is a very common situation. A lot of the complaints that she had, I was suspicious um, that uh, they were related to a thyroid problem. Um, and so we brought her back um, and provided some sedation for the blood draw. Um, you know, the, most of the credit goes to our very, very patient phlebotomist that's 
spent about two hours with her until they were successful. Um, but we did in fact find that there was a thyroid abnormality um, communicated with an adult endocrinologist in their area to establish care. And again, many of her, um, many of her symptoms uh, resolved after that treatment. Um, and then we had a 23-year-old with uncontrolled epilepsy, diabetes, and profound intellectual disability that depended on his parents for all, um, all aspects of daily living, um, had a major surgery for scoliosis. Um, and, you know, in the post-op period, there were complications that were, you know, did not require staying in the hospital, um, but dealing with pain and dealing with problems with sleeping, um, dealing with some of the medications that had either been weaned or started during this time period um, was also quite overwhelming for the family. And no one of the specialists was taking complete responsibility because, you know, because there were so many different factors interrelated to the others. Um, and so I was able to facilitate communication between the four specialists involved um, and, uh, you know, have a conversation with um, which things were, were predominating and how we could um, best give this family some comfort, give the patient himself some comfort um, and the family as well. Okay, I have the next slide. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so... Let me just see who this is for a second. Ah, yeah, so um, so this is um, the last case example. Um, and uh, uh, this is a 20-year-old with a genetic syndrome who had uncontrolled seizures, significant intestinal problems, and also was having um, quite quite severe um, behavior issues, including injuring herself. And again, the question comes up, what is contributing to that? Is it her medications? Is it the seizures? Is it the abdominal complaints that she has no other way to express but yelling and hitting herself and, um, and uh, showing it with these, um, these difficult behaviors? Now, again, this is an example of a family that um, did not have a primary care physician, either because they had already said goodbye or um, the primary care physician didn't feel confident to handle all of the complex issues. Um, their neurologist happened to retire um, at this time and there was no new physician assigned to them. And their other specialists were pretty frustrated um, and nobody was communicating with each other. So um, there were so many things that I felt um, were either falling through the cracks or, or, um, or falling through the cracks was imminent. Um, and so I stepped in and acted as the primary care physician. Actually, I still am acting as the primary care physician for now until we are able to assemble a team for them. Um, and we, you know, we've prioritized which of the specialists we think will be most important to do first. Um, and we'll do that when the family is ready. They're actually not ready right now, and that's okay. Um, and, and as I said, you know, I will, I will try to help um, with any communication, paperwork from the nursing agencies, which as you know, can be quite arduous and um, you know, it may be hard to convince any one of the specialists involved to take that on. Um, the, um, we actually were also able to get um, insurance authorization for a very expensive medication that she had been using um, and that had been abandoned about a year, pri a year prior to when we met her. Um, and, and that probably is contributing significantly to some, some adverse symptoms and, um, and her behavior. Um, and that required an extensive fight with the insurance company, um, but one that is, is definitely worthwhile because it made a very big difference. Um, and, and again, we've um, offered psychiatry visits um, and trying to address behavioral management directly. So as far as social supports, again, I'm going to pass this. I'm going to uh, pass this off to Stephanie. But um, but when when we met this family, um, they they were very lost. Um, had no idea. Um, what they were supposed to do and had actually been assigned a, a support coordination agency because they didn't know they were supposed to choose one. Um, so Stephanie, if you can explain how you were helpful. Sure. So we, this was a, a again, just to reiterate, a family who really had uh, no knowledge of the process of, you know, aging and transition. Um, and so we started at some of the basics um, and it was actually complicated more also because of the home nursing component. Um, so we started with, you know, what is an individual service plan so that they understood, you know, what that would, what that would entail and what that was supposed to do and how that was supposed to drive and was very similar to, you know, what a, an IEP is in the education setting. 
um, but that would define, um, you know, the things that are important and who that individual was going into adulthood and what services and supports are needed. Um, we talked a lot about DDD, so the CCW or CCP as it's known now, versus the supports program plus PDN services versus MLTSS. And how will we transition into the adult world and have the maximum benefit from these services and supports um, while also continually continuing the private duty nursing? And so, you know, there are a lot of nuances around that. Um, and I, I have found from many years of experience that when families are not um, educated and knowledgeable about those programs, they can sometimes be um, inadvertently assigned to a program that really does not support all the needs of the individual and give them all the benefits of um, the funding that is available. And so we had, you know, extensive discussions about what the priorities were and which programs would best support um, the individual's need. And then again, on to explain um, the NJ CAT and the tier assignments and how those factors would play in. Um, then there was the component of employment versus day programming and understanding the differences and understanding, you know, the role of DBR and where that ends and then where the long term supports and services through DDD for employment support will take over. Um, and how, you know, DBR is a more finite period of time and a more specific allocation of funding versus um, the you know, longevity of DDD supports. And then the role of support coordination, because again, they were assigned a support coordinator randomly um, or support coordination agency randomly and you know, didn't understand that they had the right to choose. And unfortunately, um, that happened before um, we were aware of it. And so we were able to go back and they were able to go through and pick a support coordinator that they felt would, or support coordination agency, um, and then be assigned a support coordinator that they felt would best be able to support them. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I would like to define before we move on quickly is just the role of our program also in one of the aspects of what I do and, um, being a liaison as far as advocacy, so with Medicaid um, and with the state, so that they are aware of the complex needs of these patients and that we can really brainstorm um, and sit at the table and try to refine the simplicity of how these programs are laid out. Um, anyone who has gone through this process or is remotely involved in this process, transition, uh, complex needs, special needs, however you want to define it, knows that, you know, you can really get caught up in the red tape. Um, and so, you know, the end game is really to find more simplicity and to be able to support families with the least amount of um, interference of, you know, different programs coming from different places and a, a more streamlined understanding of how this um, all works. So I would say even prior to transition age, but especially um, once they transition. And so those are relationships that we take very seriously um, and we have built over years and um, we continue to collaborate with the state on these issues. And again, um, was one of the reasons that we, when we developed the program, we had decided that we needed to have a specific point of contact um, within these agencies so that we could help families um, navigate as seamlessly as possible to get um, the services and supports that they need. And I would also, um, I also just just to go back to the medical piece for a minute. Um, you know, we are very grateful that um, that we have CHOP support um, for this program. But um, we are not like when we are looking for adult medical providers for these families. We are not obligated to any one health system. We're really trying to do what's best for each individual family. Trying to keep everybody um, geographically close to their homes. Um, and trying, trying to just find um, the best doctors that, that um, are able to care for, for an individual patient. Um, so I, I think that's important as well. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. So next slide. 
So I think, um, you know, I think we all share the same frustrations um, when there are, that, that when we are faced with these challenges and we're not finding comparable support and comparable services um, in the adult world. Um, and I thought this quote really said it best, that it makes no sense to spend two decades preparing children with intellectual disabilities for in independent, integrated lives in their community. And then just at the moment they are in a position to begin those lives, take away from them the services that will make that outcome possible. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and, um, and, um, and of course, the support co coordination services are a big part of that. So I will pass that off um, to Amy. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. And thank you, Stephanie, so much for your presentation. Before we start discussing um, the support coordination aspect, I just want to encourage you to uh, put any questions you may have so far inside the chat box, and we will address them at the end of this presentation, as well as the pre-submitted questions from the registrants here today. We're going to talk about now about um, support coordination with Values into Action. Uh, Values into Action New Jersey is one of the original three support coordination agencies in New Jersey. Values has been providing support coordination services since 2007, and it is all we do. We do no other service besides support coordination. We're known for it, and we do a very great job, um, and we have a lot of fans out in the community for that purpose. Uh, we can approve our own plans. Um, previously, uh, Dr. Siegel and Stephanie had mentioned the ISP, the Individual Service Plan, uh, Values into Action, has the ability to approve our own plans, which means that we do not need to go through the Division of Developmental Disabilities to have them approved um, prior to services starting. We also have support coordinators that live inside the region and counties in which they serve and support. We are open statewide for support coordinations and we serve in all 21 counties inside of New Jersey. We embrace family at Values into Action. We have a family mentor. We're one of the only, if only, organizations that has a family mentor. Her name is Zinki McGeady and she is on this call today. I'll introduce her in a moment. Um, Zinki is the parent of an adult with disabilities. She has worked with Values into Action for over 12 years. Uh, she knows the ins and outs of the systems and is kind of a big deal in the community. A lot of people know Zinki. Um, we like to joke around that we work for her. She doesn't work with us. So um, Zinki is also um, a SHIP counselor, which stands for a State Health Insurance Assistant uh, assistance program. Um, she is able to help with Medicare and Medicaid and SHIP's mission is to educate, advocate, counsel, and empower people to make informed healthcare benefit decisions. And Zinke is really good at helping the people that we support navigate that system. We're also family founded and led by local leaders. Uh, we are led by husband and wife team Paul and Marion Frederola Salino. Um, who started this organization in 2007 and also started Values into Action in Pennsylvania, which has been around even longer. Uh, we promote self-direction uh, where you control your own services and your family helps you make decisions in the support decision-making process in self-directed services. We're also a founding member of the Collaborative for Citizen-Directed Supports of New Jersey. Uh, you might have heard of that recently. It's gained a lot of traction um, inside the community, one for helping DDD as deliver uh, personal protection equipment multiple times throughout the state um, since March. Um, and also the Collaborative recently received a grant from the New Jersey Council of Developmental Disabilities to create uh, what is called an um, interactive community map that lists direct service providers and self-directed employees that are available for hire right now during COVID. It's a response to COVID and hopefully will continue beyond COVID as well. And then also Values into Action as members, are, excuse me, our members of DDD's Support Coordination Leadership Forum, which is centered around partnership with DDD to improve support coordination services statewide. As I mentioned on today's call, we have uh, Zinke McGeady, our family mentor and SHIP counselor. Right here, you can see her contact information if you'd like to reach out to her via email. We have Christina Rapizzi, one of our service directors. Uh, Christina is the uh, service director for the Northern Region Values into Action. We divide our teams into three separate regions, and she is a former support coordinator and has a lot of experience guiding and directing services and supports. 
And then myself, Amy Jadel, I am the Resource and Development Director for Values into Action New Jersey. Um, if you'd like, this is our contact information and I'll share this information with you guys also at the end of today's webinar. So who is Values into Action? Um, as I mentioned, we're a support coordination agency and we provide services according to your preferences, which is key. So in many cases, what we provide looks different for every each and every person according to what their wishes and their desires are for change inside their life. Our charge is to help each person build or sustain a system of personal supports in regard to life domains, such as living where he or she wants to live and with whom they want to live with, being a part of the community at large, which includes working, recreating, and contributing to the community, freely choosing stable and loving relationships, and then finding and maintaining meaningful employment and other activities that create and build meaningful relationships and connections inside the community, all centered around the purposes of self-direction. What is support coordination? So a support coordinator, they help you to facilitate your vision and help to create specific goals for your future, specifically in regard to community and civic engagement, employment, of course, health, housing, personal relationships, development of that ISP, which I'll talk to you a little bit about in a moment in more detail, assistance in planning to direct your funding, which um, was referenced earlier from um, Stephanie and Dr. Siegel in regard to the DDB's budget, um, and the services that are you would like to put in place to meet your goals and vision for your life or your child's life or to help your student's life. I know there are some teachers on this call today as well. Um, helping and involving, excuse me, evaluating services to make sure that those services are in fact leading to the realization of the vision that you would like to create for your life. So how does support coordination work? How do you get a support coordinator? Well, we, um, Stephanie previously mentioned um, there's a process where you first need to connect to DDD and then you do what's called the NJCAT, New Jersey Comprehensive Assessment Tool, and after that you're assigned a budget. So in the process of that, um, while that's occurring, while you're being um, approved or your application is pending with DDD, you wanna start looking into support coordination agencies. There are 186 support coordination agencies to choose from. So things can be a little bit overwhelming at times. Um, there is a DDD's website that has some basic information on there and some questions that you wanna ask your support coordination agency when you're interviewing them. One of the key questions that's not on there that I would encourage you to ask is what makes your support coordination different, your support coordination agency different, and also can you approve your own plans? Those are two really important things that you want to ask your support coordination agency when you're interviewing them. So once you've gotten approved by DDD and you've gone through the NJCAT assignment and you've been assigned a tier, you then are able to choose your support coordinator. And so the support coordination agency will assign you a support coordinator to work with you um, and your family. And the individual and the support coordinator together identify people to include on a service planning team. And that service planning team will include things, um, folks like your family members, providers, possibly neighbors, friends, significant others, et cetera. It's really going to be up to you who you want on your service planning team. If you're transitioning from the youth world through care management organizations, the term familiar with that is the child family team. So in the adult world, we call it the service planning team. So the service planning team then meets and starts to plan services and the support coordinator can authorize those services through the ISP and the service planning then begins. So after you're assigned uh, to a support coordination agency, which will start with the support coordination agency selection form, you need to submit that to DDD or you will be auto assigned. As Stephanie had mentioned earlier, you do not want to be auto assigned. You wanna have a choice in who your support coordination agency is. You can always change your support coordination agency at any time, please keep that in mind. So once the DDD assignment has been made, the support coordination agency is informed that they are now authorized to provide supports for you. And then within three days of that authorization, you should receive a call from your support coordinator. Within 10 days, your first meeting with the support coordinator should happen. Now, because of COVID, that's not happening in person. Um, it's happening generally through Zoom or over the phone. And then you complete a, uh, the person-centered planning tool, also known as the PCPT, which I'm gonna to explain to you in just a moment. That is probably the most important document that support coordinators uh, will work with and creating for you and with you. And then after 30 days, 
um, or within 30 days, actually, I should say, it should be within 30 days, the completion of the individual service plan has, has to be completed and services can begin after the ISP is approved. Once again, you wanna consider working with an agency that can approve the plans themselves. Otherwise, you have an extended wait time for DDD to approve the plan for you. If there is something that is incorrect in that ISP or is not necessarily approved by DDD, it goes back to the support coordination agency and starts the process over again where they then need to resubmit. The person-centered planning tool, as I mentioned, this is one of the most, if not the most important document that um, support coordinators use. And it's basically, I would think about it as a living document um, that has the need for continuous updates. So you wanna think about it as kind of like going on a first date. So the point is to learn all you can about the person that you're planning for. And so planning for adult life takes place in the context of the family, but the person is always at the center. It only uses everyday language. There's no medical jargon involved. It includes things such as relationships, the person's strengths, their hopes and dreams, caregiving needs, community experiences and involvement, employment goals and options, housing, voting, safety and support needs, health and medical needs, and communication style, just to name a few of the topics covered. To create the PCPT, the support coordinator works with the person and thinking about how their needs their vulnerabilities and risks can be assessed through formal and informal services and support. The support coordinator must take care to document the specific safeguards needed for each participant so the provider agencies and direct workers that working with the person understand what is expected from them. Anyone that picks up that PCPT should have a complete snapshot of the person and what they are like and what they want their life to look like. Steps in the, per, uh, the service planning process, I mentioned with the PCPT and the um, involvement and the details that need to go into that. And then from the PCPT, the individual service plan, the ISP is created. And this is where identified outcomes, services, and providers are discovered and budgeting for the services begins. The support coordinator is able to authorize budgeting for those services through the budget tier that was determined by the NJCAT. And then the final step process, which happens within that 30-day process, excuse me, that 30-day time frame, is that the individual then has the life domains addressed, such as their home, their job, the health, their recreation, and their friends and family. Here I wanted to show you some examples of budget tiers in case you have not seen them or been aware of them. This is what the support coordinator has to work with in authorizing services and supports for the person that they're working with. Um, so here, um, just to point out, this is for the fee-for-service system individual budgets. An A, a small A, is for an acuity and it's a high behavioral or medical need. Let's flip the slide here and you're gonna see the community care program budget tiers, formerly called the community care waiver. You can see that the funding here and the budgets are substantially increased, right? This is because Budgeting here can help allocate for um, housing and other options that may not necessarily or are not, I should say, qualified and covered under the fee for service program. Once again, the small a is an acuity and the high behavioral or medical need. And here are some examples of things that you can use the budget for. Um, I'm sorry, that the support coordinator can authorize to use the budget for in uh, the supports program. So we have here assistive technology, behavioral supports, career planning. Um, that can also be affiliated with DVR, by the way. Um, and we don't have DVR on the call today or have information about DVR today. But we do have a previously recorded webinar that we did with them and DDD on transition services, which I can provide to you at your request. Rehabilitation is also included in this. Two that I want to point out is the fiscal management services. Does not come out of your budget, but this is how um, services can be paid for through goods and service, for example. So a goods and service um, is really exciting and fun way to use self-directing um, services and supports. And so you can use goods and services category for things like, example, horseback riding, the gym membership, or things of that nature. And then the fiscal management services, which in New Jersey is called Easter Seals or public partnerships, PPL for short, um, those are the two FIs 
as we call them, that can use the funding budget or the budget through the funding to pay for goods and services. So goods and services are things that are not like formal providers. They're um, goods and services that are available to anybody that would be interested in using them. And they help to really expand your options for um, guiding and creating your life and to help self-direct your life as well. You'll notice here some things you might be familiar with in the youth world um, would be respite um, and maybe also transportation. One thing I also wanna point out here is support brokerage. Support brokerage is an excellent way that you can also self-direct your services by um, hiring your own employee and your own staff so that you can do ordinary day-to-day -day activities that you might need supports for um, and that person can help you with them and that person is employed by you and paid through the budget and man the budget is um, funded or I should say allocated the funding is allocated through that fiscal management service so the self-directed employee process um, can be assisted through the supports broker that can help you identify and hire and train your own staff and employee and even create for example like a training manual or like a policy and procedure manual for the person that they're working for. So here is a summary and the preparation checklist um, for people in transition for ages 18 and up and the first thing that needs to be done is confirming Medicaid eligibility. You want to do that as soon as a person turns 18. They, if they are under Medicaid for a parent or if they're under other services, in order to work with DDD and have DDD's um, services and supports and have support coordination, for example, and access that budget that we discussed, you must have Medicaid. So you want to start that on the 18th birthday. Then you want to apply for the DDD um, application, which is found on their website. If you already are using services through Perform Care, uh, which is the youth version of services in the IDD world, you can apply using the short application on their website. If you are not enrolled in Perform Care and Youth Services, then you wanna use the long application and complete the DDD intake process. Following the receipt of application from DDD and their approval of your uh, son, daughter, student, et cetera, um, you will need to complete the NJCAT. Um, also because of COVID, that's happening over the phone, no longer in person. Generally, pre-COVID, the person would come to your house, it was a DDD employee, um, and they do an evaluation um, with the person that's seeking services and supports. And in the process of all of that, you wanna research support coordination agencies and service providers. Then you will complete and submit your support coordination agency selection form, which is going to assign you a support coordination agency. That's when you receive your support coordinator assignment. And then that's when you're, once you receive your support coordinator assignment, you're going to start service planning process with your support coordinator. And then that support coordinator will complete the ISP, the individual service plan. And hopefully you've done this process before graduation. I cannot stress enough how important that is to select and start this process before graduation because your support coordinator can participate in the exit IEP meeting and also converse, plan, and collaborate with youth providers and youth um, service that they're accessing with your permission, of course, and the person's permission because they're at 18 now, right? So um, once again, encouraged to select and start working with your support coordinator prior to graduation. Then once you have done that, you can start now accessing your DDD funded community-based services upon graduation. There are some individuals that are 21 that are already receiving support coordination services and already working with some of their budget. Um, you have limited access to the budget while you're still in school because the school is technically supposed to be providing some of the services that the budget is authorized to cover. So there are some changes somewhat because of COVID and that's not questions we can necessarily answer today. That's more of a DDD specific question, um, but hopefully that helps to clarify and explain some of the um, ways that you can, or I'm sorry, the way that you can find support, find and start working with support coordination services. So we have a little treat for you today. Um, for those registrants, you will have access to this recording of this webinar and also um, this resource guide. There's over 33 different resources inside this transition guide. Um, and I'm gonna send you a link to that inside each of these folders 
our different resources, um, as well as the recording from DDD's and DVR's presentation we did back in June with them, and other resources that you might find helpful, including the sample of the NJ CAT. Um, so you'll see what type of questions are on that presentation. Excuse me, our questions are in that questionnaire in your evaluation. And then with that being said, that is the last we have today for the presentation. I'm going to start um, answering some questions that we, I'm sorry, asking the questions that we have that were pre-submitted. And these are from the registrants. Um, some are on this call today and some are not. So the first question we have is, my son will be 21 in October. I would like to learn more about transitioning into adulthood. Hopefully we've covered that for you today. Um, the person that was asking this is from Union County and the person seeking supports is 20 years old. Um, if we have not been able to answer that question for you today, please feel free to reach out to us via our contact information. Next question we have is on the job training availability. What are the step, oh, that's a separate question, I'm sorry. On the job training availability. Not quite sure what um, that's references might be a question for DVR. Um, perhaps um, our support coordinators can answer that question or um, maybe someone else that would be, um, I'm sorry, Alyssa, um, Dr. Siegel, my apologies, <laughs> um, or Stephanie, um, would you be able to answer that question? So it, I mean, I, I'm guessing it doesn't seem exactly like a question, but more about what um, is available. And so that is one of the things that we talk about and discuss in our visit is what services and supports are available through DVRS um, and how to access them and, and getting them to their county, um, appropriate county, so that we can start the intake process. And we often will make referrals um, of our patients who are not enrolled um, in DVR so that they can begin to explore what's available to them. Thank you. So can I just can I just say I you know I'm a person that tends to be somewhat in the dark about these things too because my focus has always been on the medical issues and you know so I share the the family's confusion <laughs> about um, what might be available um, so Steph if you could just sort of give um, like you know as we actually did yesterday with a family um, just an idea of what DVR offers like what are they what do they do so the first step for DVR is to do a referral. Once we do the referral, then they will then schedule an intake interview and they will bring the individual in um, and do an interview with that individual and go over many different areas um, to see where their strengths and weaknesses are and then to see what programs and supports and services they can offer um, to that person. So they can actually help you know, locate a job, um, they can help with preparation for interviewing for positions um, and then ultimately provide the job support for that individual. And for some folks, depending on their abilities, DBR may be the only process um, or agency that they need involved in that you know, period of time, whether it be three or six months um, of support may be enough. And if it's not, and it's something where the individual will require ongoing services, that's where your DDD budget, the supported employment piece of your DDD budget will take over to fund those individual supports. Thank you. That's a great response. How do you find doctor services that can treat an adult child, especially in hospitals if needed? Yes, that is a very good question. And, and I have to say that um, there are very few doctors that are in, uh, in New Jersey specifically that are designated as adult doctors that care for patients with uh, developmental disabilities and complex medical needs. There, there is actually one practice um, dedicated to that um, at, for, as a primary care practice. Um, and you know that won't be geographically convenient for everyone, um, but is available and, and I can provide more information about that if necessary. Um, you know, beyond that, I think it is very difficult. And I, I think I have to be very frank about that. I think that families who have come to us have already tried on their own and have suffered some disappointments, including physicians that will actually say to them, 
you know, why are you here in my office? There's nothing I can do for you. And, and that's, you know, a problem that we are trying to overcome in several different ways. I think, you know, from, from my standpoint, what I'm trying to do personally is to have individual conversations with doctors that may be appropriate. Um, and, and I can try to feel that out before a family ever has to go through that experience of being denied care or being, you know, um, put off in some way. Um, and I think that, that the experience and the interest um, and, you know, the ability of adult doctors to embrace this population will grow over time. You know, we are trying to start at the educational level as well, but, but as far as how individual families find a doctor, I think talking to other families that have been through the process, have been through the experience and getting information from them, um, some of the advocacy organizations like the ORC um, may have some resources available. Um, but I have to say my best advice is come to me and I will hold your hands and walk you through it and I'll do most of that work. I, I don't have a better answer than that. Um, and I have to say for me, it's not always so easy either. So. Thank you. If I can just add real quick to that too. Um, I think one of the other things that, you know, the NJ tech program really prides itself on is that our care plans are very individualized. And so what may work for one individual may not work for another individual. And that's where Dr. Siegel really shines in that she addresses the individual needs and tries to meet um, you know, those issues in totality. Well, I think, I think the other thing actually, if I can just, if I can say this is that, um, you know, people always want my list. Can I please have the list of all the doctors that want to uh, take on this, these patients? And, and I don't think there is such a list. I don't think we'll ever be able to create such a list because I, I think that, um, that, that oftentimes um, a patient with developmental disabilities has um, underlying medical issues that are quite complicated and time demanding. And in a busy uh, practice with, um, uh, with, with a provider that may not be very familiar with this type of coordination of care, um, they may not be able to take on very many patients in that category. And so, so like I said, I try to um, keep a patient um, with a doctor in their own geographic area. And it, you know, and it may be, you know, it may be a doctor that doesn't have as much familiarity, but is willing to take on this um, this challenge or this opportunity, let's say, um, to gain that experience. And then I will stay on in the background. I actually, you know, can provide medical literature to a doctor if they're not familiar with some of the complications that they should be looking for. And, and I remain available as a resource for a phone consultation or whatever else may be needed until, like I said, until there is that comfort um, in providing the care. And I think to compound those challenges are, are also insurance issues, which are always in the background. So although one individual's insurance may cover a certain provider, um, there'll be another in individual who has different insurance and that provider doesn't accept those insurances. So um, I think it's a pretty complex um, equation, unfortunately. Yeah. Great, great answers, thank you. Um, question here is, what are the, some of the biggest gaps between transition assistance services that exist on paper, but not in the real world? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> I can answer that. Um, so as a former support coordinator, a lot of times, and still to this day, um, when age out and they transition into the adult program, the common thing that we hear is that it's, it's different, right? I think you both spoke to it in your, in your slideshow was that it's not that handholding that people are used to in the pediatric world. And so it's more self-direction and you finding the resources and taking initiative to research options in your area the support coordinator can help you identify services in your immediate area. Um, they can connect you to services. They can help you schedule meet and greets. Of course, that looks different now and with COVID, um, but it is more of a direct role where it's the support coordinators following your lead. 
I hope that answers the question, but that's, that's the most, um, the most thing that we, we usually hear. That's like a real, real world situation. And if I can just tack on to that, I mean, that was the basis and the vision for, for how NJ TAC was created. So NJ TAC program's vision um, and mission was very patient and family centered. I mean, that was our focus is how do we address the patient and family need in the best way and bridge those gaps? Because we recognize the challenges of transition. I, th I think that's all very accurate. Yes, it's, it goes from a world of um, entitlement to eligibility. And I think there's a lot of um, gaps in, in the assistance in that process and helping to prepare for that process. And I think learning about what CHOP does today seems like so much of that is covered. And I think that's just incredible what you guys are doing um, to help these young adults in transition. So thank you guys for all the work that you do. Uh, the next question we have, are there resources for hearing impaired teens beginning transition? So I'm not sure what kind of um, what kind of resources you're looking for, um, but you know what? We get a lot of questions and I don't know the answers and we go looking for the answers. So, th you know, this would be a circumstance if someone came to me and said, what kind of resources are there for hearing impaired? we would go find them. <laughs> I, I don't know, I've, I don't have a better answer for that right now. Thank you. Uh, this question. I'm gonna... This is Zinke, I'd also like to throw in that, um, I think one of the first places I would look would be the Division of Deaf and Hard of Hearing and reach out to them and they may have um, a list of other resources, but that would maybe be one of my um, first few, like top five, resource places that I'd reach out to, Division of Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Thank you, Zinke. Next question is, there, is there a cohort program of yours in North Jersey? And I'm assuming that's directed to CHOP because we're statewide. And I think you guys are too, is that? Yes, we are also statewide. We cover from North to South, but we only see patients in Central Jersey, in Princeton, in the Princeton satellite. But of course, telehealth has made that much easier um, because as I said, we are seeing many patients um, by, by video um, and if needed to, to follow that, we could do a much uh, shorter visit on site. Um, but you know, as I said, you know, from north to south, east to west, <laughs> the video reaches you. And that includes the, the uh, psychiatry component. Mm -hmm. So the psychiatry is also um, virt virtual now, Stephanie? That's correct. That's that, that, yes, that's correct. Is that for medication management as well? Yes. Wow, great, thank you. That's good stuff. Um, next question we have is, will they be getting involved with self-advocacy? I'm not sure what that means exactly when you're saying they, um, but in, with support coordination, um, a lot of organizations on paper will say self-advocacy is their mission and is, is something that they're working with. Um, it's something we very strongly believe in and we're very much into supporting that. So I think it's really gonna depend on who you're connected and collaborating with and who is on your circle of support um, in regard to that. Does anyone else wanna answer that question? Yeah, so we have some resources that we use, um, some tools for uh, assessing capability, just in, even in terms of just simple household tasks or community tasks, um, so that it, it will help identify what a young adult um, is capable of versus um, what they may need to work on. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have an occupational therapy team that, um, that they actually approached us and they said, we really want to help with your program and we want to um, get these uh, families ready um, to do more. Um, and like I said, possibly some tasks that occupational therapists in the school setting were not really focusing on, um, but more self-care and, um, and, you know, whatever kind of advancements they, they, um, they can help with based on their assessments. Thank you. Next question is, do you have transition information in French or Creole? Mm -hmm. 
I don't. We do not, but we do have um, interpreter services available to us. I think our answer would be the same as well for, in regards to support coordination. Um, this question here, is there an employment or pre-vocational component? Um, so I can answer for support coordination. Um, if, if the individual hasn't gone through DVRS or was denied through DVRS, the for DDD funding does allow you to access um, job coaching services, pre-vocational services. So that is something to explore. Thank you. Next question we have is what is the best way to pursue guardianship? Um, I can answer this one because we recently did a collaborative webinar with Disability Rights of New Jersey. Um, and we learned that um, pursuing guardianship is actually the last resort, um, it's guardianship. There's other alternatives to guardianship, such as um, power of attorney, um, supportive decision-making. And so um, for this person that's asking, I can forward you the recording for that webinar, which was extremely informative and very eye-opening um, in regard to guardianship. Next question is, how can we fill her day? I know we can answer that one, Christina. <laughs> yeah. So I can answer that. Um, there's many different ways to, to fill the person's day. A lot of times when um, people transition into the adult program, they're expecting either employment or day program, but there's much more than just a, a day program. So you can um, look into in-home supports, um, Music classes, art classes, gym memberships, horseback riding, uh, pre-vocational services, community inclusion, um, tutoring. We have some people signed up at Huntington Learning Center. So really um, with PPL, with public partnerships, as long as the vendor is um, willing to accept payment from PPL. They do have to provide some vendor information and to be approved with PPL. You can try to submit for that service. It does have to be around uh, learning a skill. Uh, right now, DDD is only approving goods and services for three months at a time. So those, those art classes and tutoring, gym memberships, stuff like that. Uh, but there's there's a lot to to explore. So at Values, we really try to shy away from just uh, finding a day program for someone and really figuring out what that person wants to do with their week, where they want to go, who they want to see, who do they want to talk to, what do they want to do. Um, so there's there's just endless opportunities. Can I just add one thing to that too? I think. Um, you're absolutely correct, and I would encourage folks to also consider, you know, one of the hidden blessings of COVID is that a lot of classes and, and um, instructional uh, type programs have gone virtual. Um, and so, and my suspicion is that some component, if not all of that, will continue beyond COVID. And I think it's a wonderful blessing for families and individuals in the sense that they can access those things especially for someone who isn't able to leave home or when there's transportation complications. So um, I think as tough as COVID's been on everyone, I think it has, there have been some hidden blessings in all of it. Yeah, I, I'd like to actually add to that. Um, we're seeing, you know, since we are statewide, a lot of times, you know, the, the folks that are working up north, their services are going to differ from the support coordinators in the south, right? So now we're really able to share all of those resources because things are virtual. So if you wanted to try, if you were living down in Cape May County and you wanted to try a photography class and you haven't been able to because they're up in Passaic County, now you can do that because everything is virtual. Um, so yeah, I think it has opened up a lot of opportunity and it's also forced people to figure out what they really want to do versus relying on the day program. So now people can really explore different options. Thank you. Next 
next question is, I think you might have answered this already, Dr. Siegel, but I'll throw it out there in case you want to add more detail. How to find doctors who are able to provide competent care to people with developmental disabilities? Yeah, I think, I think we have addressed that. Um, I don't know if you feel like there's more elaboration that's needed. No, I think it's as simple as an application for the NJTAC program. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I wish, I actually wish there was a better answer than that, to be honest with you. And I think that someday, you know, there, you know, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to create an education by, by connecting families with new doctors that like, like I said, may not have the experience, but, um, but they're, they're going to get there. And I think that, you know, you know, ex an experience with an individual patient can create a new interest and a new love for, um, for this kind of work. And, and that's what we're trying to do. I mean, and I think by, by taking some of the load off of the doctor, which is really one of the biggest deterrents. Um, I think that hopefully by, by our ability to do that, um, they will be more, more, you know, more receptive. Thank you. Can you have PPP and respite? I can answer this one. Um, so by respite, I'm, I'm assuming that you are referring to in-home supports. A lot of times when uh, people transition into the adult world, they use the respite lingo, um, but it is considered individual supports or in-home supports in the adult world. Um, but yes, you can, you just have to bill at separate times. So if you're assigned, say 10 hours through the personal preference program, you just want to make sure that the hours you are using don't overlap the DDD funding. So if PPP is from 10 to 2, you shouldn't, you can't really start your DDD till 2 o'clock and on. So you just want to make sure they don't overlap. But you can have both because they're totally separate. Thank you. I think this question is for CHOP. What kind of programs do you offer for adults with learning disabilities? I'm not sure what the person means about programs for people with learning disabilities. Um, yeah, I'm not really, so, so we have some programs within CHOP. Um, there's the REACH program, um, there's CHOP Career Path, um, but they're not really, they're not day programming per se. So I'm not really sure what the person, if they can clarify what they're specifically asking for. Um, let me see if they're on today. I don't see them on right now. We can revisit that if they come back. What services are uh, available to those 18 to 20 years old prior to DDD services? This person is actually on the call right now, so I will message them and ask them to clarify for that. Um, this question I think is for you, Zinke. How can I advocate for my daughter's Medicaid insurance to cover, um, yeah, to cover, tri I'm gonna say this wrong, tri trisomy 21 clinic services. I'm actually thinking that's a, two-pronged question and probably um, Stephanie and Dr. Siegel could pick up my answer. So to advocate, I would certainly be um, in ensuring that the person is enrolled in SSI um, and that's the first, you know, journey that the um, Medicaid might come from. If the person's not eligible for SSI, then I would be reaching out to the Board of Social Services to find out what other Medicaid programs might be applicable. Um, and certainly if, if you're finding stumbling blocks or a wall, I would be reaching out to Disability Rights New Jersey and Community Health Law Project to see um, just, you know, what is it that needs to be done or addressed to um, ensure that that person does have Medicaid. But I'm thinking that that question may have another meaning. Are you able to get an Amy? 
Yes, I'm, I'm on the call, Darlene Reeves. That's my question. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for um, answering that question. But the problem I ran into, and it's just to advocate for all um, um, young adults and all adults with um, special needs that have Medicaid, um, we need more flexibility in the state of New Jersey, you know, in terms of specialized doctors. If, there's, if it's not available in our state, like the CHOP Center has exactly what my daughter needs. Because she uh, just has Medicaid, they don't accept the Medicaid through um, Blue Cross Blue Shields, that particular provider. So the company that does is United, but the state and United is having some issues, so I can't mm -hmm. transfer her over. So unfortunately, uh, because I have private insurance, I'm going to have to use that avenue. But if she didn't, you know, have, you know, private insurance, the option for private insurance, then she would be stuck. And um, she couldn't get the, you know, proper services that she needs. So, so I can, so if I can just jump in for one second, this is Stephanie from NJ Tech. So I'm glad that you clarified that because that's helpful to be able to address the question specifically. So just so you understand, so you are correct, CHOP. Um, does not have contracts with um, most of the Medi New Jersey Medicaid providers. However, um, NJ TAC is a specialty program. And so we have the ability to do a, a single case agreement for patients. And so we never discourage a patient from completing an intake because we have insurance specialists that will um, advocate on the patient's behalf to get that single case agreement so that the individual can see um, our program. The state um, was a partner in developing this program with us. That was our sort of our first step. Um, and many of the state legislators are aware of our program and the benefit of our program to the New Jersey constituency. And so we have, you know, for lack of a better term, that leverage in being able to do that. Um, and we can be relentless in that because we, we understand that there is no one within the network of providers that the New Jersey Medicaid HMOs offer who can do the same thing that this program can do for patients and families. Okay, now who would I contact, you know, to, to, to do that? Um, because I, I say the worst case scenario, God forbid if I lose my job, I can't rely on my, um, you know, insurance, you know, mm -hmm. to provide for her because she's an adult now. And um, so I'm just wanna make it, whereas, you know, if she's on her own and someone else has to take over, she still can get the services through the CHOP. They could, they could be her primary um, provider. Well, so, okay, so that, I'm glad that you asked that question too. So we have to provide further clarification. So we do not take the place of primary care. Um, as I said, we are a specialty program um, okay. and we are actually currently in conversation um, with our leadership as well as the state in exactly defining what our continued role can be for patients. Um, okay. As I said, we would still establish care um, if we can get the single case agreement and we would work very hard to get that single case agreement to be able to see the patient and then continue to advocate um, you know, for continued visits um, on a follow-up basis, but we would not take the, care, the place of primary care. So oh. we would still, you know, if you came to us and that was a concern, that would be something that Dr. Siegel would um, address and try to identify as part of your care plan to find a provider within your network that can be your point of contact for primary care. And then awesome. we would sort of be in the background to work in conjunction with that primary care person if there's um, specific areas outside of their realm of expertise. Okay, so do you feel as though that there is some um, necessity for advocacy around making Medicaid universal for our population, because considering the complex complexity of, you know, their issues? Absolutely. I mean, we, we have to always advocate. I mean, this population has to be represented full force all the time um, with legislators and um, state leadership and Medicaid so that they understand the limitations around, um, you know, not having access to the care that we need. So, okay. and which is something that we continue to do, um, you know, from, from our program perspective and our patient population, um, we gather a lot of data and we present data to the state um, every three months on the types of issues and patient population that we are caring for and you know, try to highlight the issues around that. 
um, and absolutely connect with them when there is an issue um, around a specific patient and not being able to access the care that they need. Okay. You know, I will, I'm going to be very honest with you, and I would say this publicly to anyone, so I'm not afraid or ashamed to say it on this call. You know, since COVID happened, um, you know, things have become very complicated or stalled, if you will, um, because a lot of the focus has gone to the, you know, priority of COVID and okay. addressing the needs and concerns around COVID. But this has not been, um, it's, it's not lost on us, and it has not become less of a priority for us. Okay, I, I thank you for that. And I just one other comment, and then I'm, I'm, you know, fine. The in even like in and out of network is is an issue even within our state. So say for instance, like my daughter has anxieties with blood work. So Clara Mass has a really good program that can handle our population with um doing blood work, and but the only problem is we don't accept, they don't accept the HMO for that that she has, but they accept the United. That you know, so there's no really flexibility between in and out of network, so it's quite a struggle. And Do you have a case manager within your HMO? Yes, and um, we we went through that. It was denied, you know, in terms of um, you know, um, you know, service because you gotta you we have to use someone in network, which Clara Mass is not. So we go to Newark Beth Israel, and you know, she's gonna, she's freaking out or gonna freak out. So it's like, okay, I'm now I have to pay out of pocket. So it's important that, you know, there should be some flexibility in that arena. Absolutely. Agreed. Yes, that's it. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, that's all for the pre-submitted questions. Uh, Christina, if you want to move to the um, chat box here. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Up here. Uh, first question, what discussions do you or your staff have with families about establishing supported decision making arrangements as a less restrictive alternative to guardianship? This is for We always discuss all the options around guardianship um, and obviously would support the least restrictive um, mechanism be in place. Um, however, you know, that's a, a discussion that while we weigh in, you know, that ultimately is the individual and family's, dis, you know, final decision. And we will support whatever decision they feel is best. I think more than anything, I think we help to clarify some of the definitions. I think it's very, sometimes can be very confusing as to um, uh, what one, what uh, full guardianship versus, um, you know, uh, you know, whatever power of attorney or, you know, whatever options have been presented. Sometimes people are very confused about it and we can help to um, help them to understand it. I don't know that we necessarily try to guide people to make the decision. But we, want, we always encourage families to think about those things because what we have found in, in our experience is that there have been many times where someone is not um, appropriately covered by some form of guardianship, shared decision-making, power of attorney, healthcare proxy. And then in a medical situation, um, that becomes a real complication, especially in the adult world, in that... Um, when a medical emergency or situation comes up um, and needs to be dealt with, there are not the proper um, documents in place to support that patient. And so we never want those decisions to be made under duress because that can be a, an issue of time. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, Easter had asked, uh, my daughter's turning 21 this December 2020, but graduates in June 2021. What DDD services, if any, can she obtain upon turning 21, but before graduating from school? And is Values Into Action accepting new clients at this time? Uh, Values Into Action is open and accepting new clients. So feel free to reach out to us and fill out the support coordination selection form. Also, once your daughter turns 21, she has access 
access individual supports and goods and services as we were talking about a little bit earlier, any sort of classes. Um, so she will be able to access things upon turning 21. We can explore that more um, working directly with you and knowing what she's, she likes to do. Okay. Uh, is there any estimate of how long DDD application reviews and approvals are currently taking based on COVID? How long should it take now for a response? Um, someone had answered that later in the chat and said to phone the Patterson DDD office to speak to the DDD intake to follow up. Um, Amy, I know you had a, a comment about that as well. Yeah, definitely call and follow up. It generally takes about three months to get your application approved. Um, you want to make sure that they actually received your application. I'm not sure if you sent it in via mail or email. I work to assist um, young adults in transition that are aging out of the school systems and processing their DDD applications with and for them um, along with the school and the families um, and the student themselves. And there have been challenges um, since COVID in receiving the paper applications. So um, definitely call in and check to see if they received your application. Um, and if not, then you're gonna need to resubmit it and request a signed uh, receipt when you're mailing it through the post office. I'm not sure if you guys know, there's been a lot of challenges with the post office lately. I personally have had four of my own. I hope that doesn't happen to anybody else. So if you're mailing it out, make sure to get a signed receipt. Yeah, it's important to note a lot of people at DDD are working remotely. Yeah. So that's going to add a little bit of time um, to anything that's being submitted. Okay. Um, someone asked if the presentation will be emailed or can they access it in some way? Amy had said earlier that it will be emailed to all on the call. Scrolling down here. Um, when, when an individual, an adult, uh, goes to the hospital, are there, because they have pediatric wings and pediatric ERs, is there somewhere particular where adults with disabilities can be treated um, outside of the adult section? I don't think so. So, so I think, I, I don't know if we're looking at the same question. I mean, the question actually asks, is there a way to work with hospitals that have pediatric wings and pediatric ERs to um, allow, you know, allow these kids, in quotes, to be a part of that? You know, I think that obviously that would be very individual, hospital to hospital. Um, I would say to be perfectly frank and realistic, um, it's not very likely that, that there's going to be a new philosophy that you know, children um, with disabilities that grow to be adults with disabilities can stay forever. I think um, if, if anything, I mean, there are definitely certain conditions um, where there is no adult counterpart elsewhere. And I think those, those individuals will stay in the pediatric setting until you know, the uh, medical community evolves to accommodate them. Um, but I will also say that that you know we have a lot of dreams and we have a pretty long wish list of of what we hope uh, will um, that we can accomplish and what we hope will be established. Um, I will say that it's you know my vision would be that adult no. facilities are much more stable. Um, I was, I'm sorry, I was saying that you know it would be my my vision that adult facilities are more able to accommodate these patients and are better um, able to give the support that the pediatric um, facilities do, that they are able to provide comparable services. And in fact, you know, obviously this is a very complicated question with, you know, lots of factors that play in, but, but I don't know that the that the best answer is to have adults in a pediatric facility. I think that there are advantages that adult physicians can offer that pediatricians may not be able to offer. Um, and, and I think that the adult um, facilities and the pediatric facilities should be working together um, to get the most out, to get the best out of each other. Um, and you know, if 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 anybody you know 
asked my opinion or put me in charge, that's what I would work on. I'm not asking to be in charge, by the way. <laughs> I just uh, I think I think it would be a big undertaking, and and but and and you know the steps that we're taking are very small steps. But I think that is the ultimate goal, is to have adult facilities, you know, accommodate um, these families the same way that pediatric facilities do. Okay, thank you for answering. Um, Patricia did put in the chat, so so you all know that about finding doctors and specialists, there is one of the resources that NJDCF gives is the directory of professionals on the Autism NJ website, autismnj.org. So that may be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Also, another um, resource that Patricia put in, mainstreamingmedicalcare.org. So that's great. Okay, I think that's it in the chat, you guys. Any other questions that anyone wants to pop into the chat? Just a comment, I see here Patricia um, shared the link to the support coordination agencies around the state. That's also in my um, resource guide that I'll be sending you of those 30 plus resources that that list is in there as well. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. We hope that um, you found this very helpful and informative. Um, you'll have our contact in the follow-up email that you'll be receiving within the next 24 hours of so that will have a link to the recording of this presentation as well as the resource guide that we have been discussing um, and feel free to reach out to us if you uh, have any questions or need any clarification on any topics. Thank you once again so much for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the NJ Tech program for Dr. Alyssa Siegel and Stephanie Pratico for joining us today in collaboration and getting this information out to the community and the people that we help to support as well. Um, feel free to share the recordings with um, those that you find or think would find this information helpful. Thank you again and hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, have a good day.